Uh, I am Jay Little. I'm a game designer and I also teach game design at UW Stout in Menominee, Wisconsin. I've been designing games for a number of years. I used to work with WizKids, Fantasy Flight Games. I'm best known for uh, the X-Wing Miniatures game and the Star Wars roleplay line, as well as a few other expansions for games like Cosmic Encounter and WizWar. Um, so I've been in the industry for a long time and I've gone to dozens and dozens of conventions over the years. And one of the things that's constantly been an issue is whenever I want to show a game, how do I get that game idea across? And we see it particularly well here at Protospiel where we can kind of let our guard down and we know that we're in a safe environment to talk about our games and to share our experiences. So this is a great opportunity to refine your ability to talk about your game, identify what it is about your game that is special so that you can convey that to others. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. And um, there are a lot of different ways we can do it. Now, earlier, the uh, retailer had talked about 5,000 SKUs or individual stock units. I've heard 7,000. Um, so somewhere between five and 7,000, let's call 6,000. But that's between accessories and supplements and core games, expansions. That's a lot of stuff. And the big thing to think about is all of the different places those new stock units are coming from. I mean, you've got your mainstream publishers like Asmodee and Wizards of the Coast. You've got indie publishers that are doing smaller print runs and specialty things and maybe only regional. But then you also have what I call vanity press, which are people who are us using very, very small limited print run where maybe it's only a store or two in their local area. They're really just focused on, I did a thing and I want to be able to share it with people around me. And then Kickstarter and all those other crowdfunding platforms. So you think about each of these as different streams all forming together into a river. And the reason that's important to understand is there will only ever be more competition. You will never, ever, ever go up against less competition from this point forward. And that is really, really daunting, especially if that many thousands of things are coming out just in the board game industry. Because when you're talking about your particular game and how to get it exciting, how to get it in people's hands, you are not just competing for a group of people who want to play board games you're competing against every other thing that has ever been created for entertainment in the history of mankind, <laughs> right? So, wow, right? Uh, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 Netflix series dropped. Well, you know what? I wasn't board gaming for those episodes. I was watching uh, Misty instead. So anything that a group of people could be doing together or individually, that's your competition. And what's tough is a game being a social experience requires several people to all agree that this is our best use of time. Not three of us want to get together in game and one of us wants to binge watch something for the weekend. So you're always going up against more and more competition. Now, the good part about that is the more competition there is, the more things there are out in the marketplace, the greater the opportunity to show a distinction between the low end and the real high end quality things that are gonna set themselves apart and be attractive. So what we wanna do is focus on how do you get to that position? How many of you have heard the concept of the elevator pitch before? Great. Now, uh, the most common way that people hear about the elevator pitch is they think about it in very, very simple terms about, about, oh, come on. about a thing. So I'm going to skip forward to the next one. All right. Most people think about an elevator pitch being you join somebody at the lobby and they are forced, they are a captive audience to listen to you all the way up to their floor. And then you get off. So that the idea is you get off of the elevator and they're on there stuck with whatever you had talked to them about. And most people take a look at that's my opportunity to be able to sell my game, to sell my idea. Whatever amount of time that may be, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, whatever it might be. That is a daunting task, to come up with something succinct, accurate, and reflective of your game. What I was going to show with this, but now uh, what I really think a lot of people mistake is that there's another elevator trip back down to the lobby. And most people don't consider that part of it. So imagine that your elevator trip is you get on the elevator with somebody else that you're trying to impress, you go up to the top floor, then you get off the elevator, and that person's friends get on the elevator and ride back down to the lobby with them. That's the important thing. They're going down there without you. What is it about your game, your product, your idea, 
that they are going to be talking about. After you explain your game, after you give a demo, after you give a pitch, can they give a demo or a pitch to other people? Are they going to be able to focus on the same things that you think that your game is all about? So I'm sure many of you probably heard the game of telephone. If I came up here and whispered something to him and they whispered it and they whispered it, by the time it got around the room, it might be a completely different story. The same thing can happen with your game as well. Uh, I just talked about a few minutes ago, personal branding. You know, I'm a middle-aged, overweight, white guy. That does not do anything to separate me at conventions or make me distinct. <laughs> so I figure if somebody's gonna meet me, they're gonna only remember a few things. I want to be in control of what those things are, which is why I paint my thumbs, which is why I'm always wearing a Hawaiian shirt and cargo pants, which is why I've got a dye earring. I'd much rather have remember that than other things that are less flattering. Well, if I were a game, what are those quirky things about me that I want people to remember and be able to share with other people? Going, oh, look, instead of that's Jay, it would be, oh, look, that's Jay's game. That's just as valuable. One big key to this that I think a lot of people rush past because they're so excited about their design is they forget that games are a social experience about telling a story. We just instinctively tell stories better than we share, relate, and internalize data, statistics, and information. We've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. I'm sure many of you probably have stories that have been handed down generation to generation, maybe about how uh, parents or grandparents arrived in this country or crazy wacky things that may have happened at a family reunion. You might not know the exact dates, the exact times, but you know the stories that are related to those. Stories are really, really important. For example, how many of you have played the game Risk? If you think back to all the games of Risk that you remember, what are the defining features? Do you remember the game of Risk because of specific dice that you rolled? Or do you remember, oh, Indonesia is awesome because you can lock down all of Australia, to just a few people in Indonesia. And it's that game that you played where just a few guys held off this huge army and you're able to talk about it like that and you share that story and you tell that story, embellish that story, that's exciting. When people can relate your story to others, you've got to win. That's something that they can remember and that they can pass along. Now, the risk with that is people tend to remember two types of stories, really, really good stories and horror stories, right? And a lot of times you've probably heard that people only are going to post a review if it's really positive or really, really negative. So you want to make sure that you're leaving a positive impression. What is it with these? Oh. You know what though? I'm really good at this. So I am not going to freak out. Because you have to be able to handle the unexpected. Things are gonna throw you a curveball. I had actually thought that something was gonna go wrong later in the presentation, but hey, you know what? You have to adjust on the fly. You never know when it's going to happen, but it will. One of the things that I teach my students is no matter how remote the chance seems, if it can happen, it will happen, and you have to account for it. Uh, I designed something for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay that I thought would never happen. I made a joke of a card that people are going to roll a bunch of dice, eight-sided dice, and if they all come up with this one chaos star on them, then the person blows themselves up and they're immolated, and haha, isn't that funny? And people will look at that, and they'll laugh, and it will never happen. It's not even a month since the product is released and on the forum somebody is posting about how their wizard got all arrogant and they were ready to cast their spell and he blew himself up. And that was a really important lesson to learn because that was a story that they will never, ever, ever forget. It wasn't necessarily the best story and it made me realize that every single decision that I make in a game can impact the outcome. Because no matter how many times you play test a game, no matter how many times you think that you've gone over it and prepared for it, you cannot prepare for the number of times it is going to be played once it is released to the world. Your sample size with your playtests is not big enough to represent so many that you're going to get both ends of a bell curve of how a game might resolve. One way that you can make sure that that uh, experience is consistent is to draft a mission statement for your game. The physical act of Forcing yourself to articulate and write down what your game is about and what your game means to you makes you face up to that and really make some tough decisions. 
because sometimes you might have conflicting ideas about exactly what your game is or what it is trying to do. What's great about this too is you have it documented. You can go back and revisit it. You can look later on if you're stuck or you've hit a wall and you're not sure what to do next, revisit that mission statement. You can go back there, you can share that with playtesters as well and see do they feel like the game that you presented them matches up with the mission statement that you've drafted. But it's a great design tool as well because it gives you this measuring stick. It gives you something to compare some of your decisions to. Because essentially, if you are making decisions that do not get you closer to your mission statement, then you're off mission. And there are only two things that can happen. You either change the decision or you change your mission. Otherwise, you're no longer going after the game that you originally went. This can help make sure that you're creating a consistent experience that matches up expectations and you don't go chasing too many red herrings or go down too many rabbit holes. How many of you have designed a game and get so excited about one fastener feature that you start to focus solely on that and develop that and then eventually realize that that's not really tied to the original idea that you've had? That's probably half of everything I've ever worked on. And you reach a point where it's like, I just can't believe I spent weeks working on something that really has no place in this game. Maybe expansion content, maybe this is a different game. I go back to my mission statement and decide whether or not this is on task. And sometimes I realize that, you know what, I need to change my mission statement. This is important or interesting enough that I am rethinking my original goal. And that's okay too. But it helps keep you on track. Over the years, I have talked to dozens and dozens of publishers, retailers, fellow designers, and a number of people to try to get inside their head about what is the most important information as a designer that you need to convey, or as a player or publisher you want to know when somebody is pitching a game to you or when somebody is presenting a demo. And it's been great because I'm obsessed with the number three. You're going to see it throughout this. I'm going to refer to it a lot. If you play test with me at all this weekend, you will hear it over and over and over again because three is enough to have options without being overwhelming, and I've got a whole bunch of other little aphorisms for the number three. But here are three key questions that people want to know, and this can help them form expectations for your game. And I cannot overstate how important I think that having these thought out and answered is. And the first one is making sure that it is very, very clear to everyone who you are in the game. Unless it is a pure abstract game, the assumption is that you're assuming a role, a farmer, a construction worker, a medieval knight, whatever it is, you're asking them to step outside themselves and into some other role. And if that's not clear, that's strike one. That's a disconnect that they're going to have difficulty remembering. That's not going to be enough parody with the story for them to remember that, or at least not in a good way. The second thing people want to know is what you do. I am a knight, who you are, in a jousting tournament who is trying to defeat all of the others. Hey, that gives me a better idea of the sort of things I'm going to do. We haven't even talked mechanics yet. We're still on the story part. And finally, how you win. Few things bother me more than when somebody showcases a set of mechanics to me, but then they don't give me any idea what I'm working toward or why I care oh, look, you can do this and this and that. I'm like, okay, great, but how do you win? You can do this and this or that. <laughs> All right, but how do I decide which one of those I want to do? It's easy to actually overlook in marketing. Now, uh, the retailer also talked about how important the box is. Imagine not being able to communicate on the box when somebody picks it up, flips it over, and reads it. If they can't understand this information, they don't have any context for the rest of the game. It's probably going back on the shelf. In fact, the back of the box is prime real estate for this. And I think that my time at Fantasy Flight Games was really informative about just how important this is. And I had my presentation up when Brian Walker was talking uh, just to kind of check things and see if we were on the same page. And by and large, we were with a lot of the things. Make sure that the name is up there. Make sure that you've got pictures of both art and components, maybe something in play and how it is set up. But the important thing here is that Specifically with Fantasy Flight games, whenever I was working on a project, I made sure that the description on the back had two paragraphs. They both answered who you are, what you do, and how you win. The first one 
did it in a dramatic way that told the story, and the second way told the mechanics of how it's accomplished. You can successfully have a who you are, what you do, and how you win story focused on both. The great thing about that is you can use whichever one you need. If you're talking to a publisher, they might be more interested in the mechanics, and if they ask for that, boom, you've got that story, and then you can provide the drama to back it up. Conversely, if you're trying to get somebody at a convention to sit down and demo your game, oh, you want to entice them with that story, and then when you've got their attention, you tell them the who you are, what you do, and how you win mechanically, and they can decide if this is the sort of gameplay that appeals to them. Would you look at that? So I ended up using an example for one of the games that I brought here. I've got a prototype for a game called Wrath of Vesuvius, which is a game about creating and then destroying Pompeii. And this is a little lengthier than I would normally want, but the publisher liked this longer text. And it tells a story. It tells a very narrative story about what's going on in Pompeii and the resulting volcano. But I've also highlighted the blue part is who you are, the red part is what you do, and the green part is how you win. And I'm able to succinctly, well, maybe I'll edit it down a little bit, get that idea across in just a few sentences. Whether I've got the board with me, whether I've got it laid out, I can give them an idea and see if that uh, excites them and engages them, if they can put themselves in that position and, and see where I'm going with it. On the flip side, the second paragraph on the back of the box talks about the mechanics where you're going to be laying down tiles, you are going to be scoring during different phases, you're going to be placing tokens. I don't want to lead with that. I want to give them a story and then these mechanics help flesh out and go, oh wow, I get to be the lava? I wonder what that's like. Ooh, I get to place things down and destroy stuff. Awesome. It gives them a frame of context for it. And again, I highlight who you are in blue, what you do in red, and how you win in green. And I do that to make sure that I'm addressing all three of those questions when I am describing the game. Now, if this is something that you're going to be demoing on a regular basis, you could use this as your script. If the back of the box or another description online, like the BGG entry, is strong enough, you could crib that down as part of a script to be able to really uh, easily convey the important elements of your game. If you find that you're having difficulty establishing or answering one of those questions, if I were in that position, I'd go back and look at my mission statement, or I might ask somebody else, all right, now that you've tried the game or now that you've played it, what do you think the answers to these questions are? I'm too close to the project myself to tell. I need somebody else to give me some input. So perhaps over this weekend, if you've brought some prototypes, take a look at it and think to yourself, all right, if I'm going to explain this game to someone else, if I sit down for a prototype playtest with you, I will probably ask these at the beginning so that I can get into the right mindset for it, uh, for playtesting. So I'll quiz people. Part of being able to tell a good story is being able to communicate clearly. I don't remember a lot from college, but one of the things that I remember was freshman year when I took Journalism 101, the ABCs of good communication. And I will always remember this because it's another thing of threes. And I believe in it strongly in every class I teach, no matter what it is, freshmen through seniors, board game, design, critical thinking, I always teach and preach this concept. Make sure that when you are communicating with others that what you are saying is accurate. For gaming, this could mean that it is the current rule set. There are a few things more embarrassing in my career than when I went to a convention and somebody asked me to teach them how to play X-Wing. So I taught them how to play X-Wing. And then somebody interrupted and said, no, you're wrong. You're playing it wrong. Um, oh, wait, you're Jay? Didn't you design this? Um, no, right? But I wasn't up to speed on the most current set of rules. So there was no way that I could communicate accurately with the people that were interested. So make sure that what you're communicating is accurate. Try to keep it brief. I struggle with this. Sometimes it takes me an hour to write a one paragraph email because I'm always worried that it's too much or they're not going to read it or I'm going to have to break it down to bullet points or whatever it might be. Do your best to keep it brief. Now, I think the text on the Pompeii box and on casting the old world and Blood Bowl team manager, which are the other two examples, 
I think that was a little bit long. It's hard to expect somebody to read through all of that and get the gist of everything if they're just going to skim it. So sometimes you're going to fight against this and it's going to be difficult because you want to talk about your game. You want to talk about your idea. You're so excited about it. You want to get other people excited about it too. Try to restrain yourself and be brief and focus on the things that best express your idea. And then lastly, be clear. Jargon, industry speak, or things that are very, very specific about your game, you have to be careful when you use that language if you have not already defined what it means. So I teach in the School of Art and Design. On day one in some classes, I will ask my students, what is design? The industrial engineers have a different idea than the interior designers, have a different idea than the studio artists, have a different idea than the game designers. They all have design in their role and their degree, but their concept of design is very, very different. So I have to be very, very clear and define at the outset, all right, for this semester, what I mean by design is this. And if I mean something different, I will let you know. Sometimes it's not just enough to say that it's a worker placement game, because depending on their experience, which worker placement game that they played may or may not sync up with what you mean. I had described a game when I sent it to a publisher and he was excited about it because I was talking about it as a drafting game. And then when he received it, he's like, I did not feel that at all. This is a resource management game. And I was scratching my head going, what? What did I miss about my own game? And then I played it around thinking from that perspective. I'm like, oh, you know what? He's absolutely right. I was focusing on the wrong part of the game. And that can be really difficult. So when you have other people's opinions and you can hear them, boy, is that really um, both reassuring, but also a little bit embarrassing and sobering that you have this awesome game that you love so much that you were wrong about on some aspects, but it's so helpful. If you can be accurate, brief, and clear when you're communicating to a audience, whether it's a publisher or a player, they can give you the best possible feedback. If you can't be clear with your communication toward them, they cannot be clear in their communication back. Something is going to get muddied along the way. Speaking of threes, over the years, I have found that there are three particular areas of focus where you can really, really set yourself apart and stand out. Obviously, there are more than three, and different players or publishers may be looking at different things, but overall, I have found these three things to be true. If you can show how your game is distinct, is there something novel? Doesn't mean is it brand new. When uh, Dominion first came out and deck builders became a thing, within a year we had a dozen deck builders, but they weren't all like Dominion. Ascension I thought was great and very different, and I loved Thunderstone, which was different. I look to see, is this game at least three steps different from whatever game I'm borrowing from, right? So if I want to make a deck builder, if I want to make a worker placement game, I'm obviously going to have some sort of source or inspiration. I may love the way that Kalis did it, but not the way Carcassonne did it. All right, so I'm going to start out with this as my base, but I can't just copy it, as we heard legally before, but I do want to be influenced by it. I've seen something solid that works. I want to put my own unique spin on it. So to satisfy my own goals, I want to make sure that it is at least three, it is different in at least three ways that I can communicate. When X-Wing first came out, I had a lot of people tell me it is just like Wings of War. And that was really frustrating. Eventually it became, it is just like Wings of War, except for the combat system and the movement system and the dial system and the out. And I'm thinking, then it is not like Wings of War. I am satisfied now that I have created a unique enough experience in space with combat and dice that I wasn't worried about it. Obviously I was influenced by every other game that does dog fighting, right? But I wanted to make sure that my, mine was distinct. The second thing is to be professional. I'm giving you a 50-50 example here with the way this is operating. No, but, but be professional. You are presenting not just yourself, but your game. And professionalism can account for how uh, prepared you are, for double-checking your rule book, which we'll be hearing about later, for accuracy, to make sure that you're consistent with your use of terms like round, turn, phase, player. Also, dress up, right? <laughs> if you have a particular... Um, way of dressing, or if you're going to, I, I act and conduct myself differently in front of a publisher than I do with players. The language that I use is different. 
so that I try to uh, best situate it for who I'm talking to. It's kind of like how a lot of people, even if they swear like a pirate normally, when they're in front of kids, most people have a filter where they can go ahead and adapt their language to the audience that they're speaking with. And then finally, making sure that what you've created really has a strong player focus. And that might be through player agency, which is the ability for players to direct their own um, path to victory, or whether it is by having cards that are laid out in a way that is very easy to read and follows conventions that help support things and maybe even took into account colorblind considerations by using a little filter on your phone that you can check really quickly to see if it's uh, colorblind friendly. There are a lot of things that you can do and a lot of different things to tailor it to a more enjoyable player experience. All of these things are basically to get back to letting them tell a story. If it's not distinct, if it's not professional, if it's not focused on the player, those are the things they're going to remember. These are all filters that your information has to pass through for them to get the final message. So you want it to have as little resistance as possible. If it's professional, it's gonna to get to them better and they're gonna accept it more. If it's player focused, publishers are gonna be great. This is something marketable that people will want and the players will be like, great, this is something I want to play. It's easy sometimes to get caught up in making decisions that are best for you or fulfill what you think rather than really being player focused. If you're left-handed versus right-handed, sometimes the way that you lay out the play space might be different. So just some general things like that and double checking before you move on that you're actually taking into account how the player is going to be interacting with it. Specifically with play testers, there are three other things you can do. Oh my gosh, three. It's, oh, I'm so happy. Um, so I found over the years, I have run probably hundreds of demos at dozens and dozens of conventions, as well as events like Protospiel. You are just constantly sharing your game with other people. Over the years, I've gotten better at it. It is a skill like anything else. The more you practice, the better you can get. And some of the things that I have learned over the years, whether through trying to do it myself or engaging in a play test that really you know, strained me, be prepared. Make sure that the play space is set up. Make sure that you have whatever is needed to get that game ready so that when they sit down, you can go. They are taking time out of their schedule and donating it to you. And so make sure that you're prepared and are able to respect that donation. Even if you don't think your game needs player aids, it needs player aids. Whether it is a turn summary, whether it is highlighting the key terms that are used in the game that they're gonna see, or whether it is a summary of victory conditions. Every game can benefit from a player aid. One, as the designer, it forces you to take a look at it and see, is this accurate? Oh wait, these terms aren't the same. I better fix something before I share it with others. But also, no matter how well you think that you're able to describe something, someone's gonna be distracted by their phone or somebody else is walking by or this is the 10th demo that they've played that day, a player aid is always valuable and it gives them something to look at when it's not their turn. So if your game has a lot of downtime, a player aid is a way to mask that a little bit. But a player aid is another way to be player focused and help them enjoy your game the most so that they can tell good stories. And the best play tests that I've experienced are when they thank me afterward. I'm like, huh, wow, you know, makes me feel a little bit better about it. Doesn't change my opinion of your game, but it changes my opinion of you and how professional you are. Um, I try to do that here. I'm not always successful. When I'm at a convention, if I'm demoing for a company, I shake everybody's hand and thank them for their time, and then I reach in for my PRX and wipe my hands off. But to me, it's important to make that contact, eye contact with them, thank them for their time. Sometimes I'll have them come back later in that convention to sit down for another demo or bring their friends over. Now, I don't know if it was because I followed these things, but I like to think that being prepared like this helps position me to give them the best experience possible. This is really interesting how it doesn't always consistently do this. Has anyone heard of GNS theory before? Wow, okay, a few, not many. GNS theory is actually uh, comes out of indie role playing. Uh, a guy named Ron Edwards designed this fantastic indie game called Sorcerer, one of the first of that real indie fusion of RPGs that came out late 90s, early aughts. And he ran a forum that debated and discussed role playing. 
I loved that forum because also as a tabletop fan, I found so much of this applied. And then as I got into more video game design and teaching, I realized, you know what, it applies to video games. Hey, this just applies to gaming in general. So GNS theory was this attempt to create a unified theory of gaming. They started out by role playing, but they ended up moving it a unified theory. Wow, wouldn't it be great if we could explain all the mysteries of the game verse with some system that we all agree on? Well, first, it's not going to happen. But second, this had three characteristics, so I was really interested. <laughs> but once I learned what these three characteristics were and I was able to engage in discussion and debate about it, I'm like, wow, I really think that this tool is valuable. And it breaks down that GNS is for gamist, narrativist, and simulationist approaches to gaming. Fancy, fancy terms. The first one, gamist. This aspect or type of game really appeals to people who like strategies, tactics, and they like the game mechanic part. The story might be important, but the mechanics, the function of how a game works. They can look at a game, play a game, and they can see how it's going to work together. They want to guess how mechanics interlock, and they are really focused on design. And for the people who really appreciate gamist, things that don't work mechanically will stick out like a sore thumb to them or these will be the people who really want to try to break your game. Narrativist, I don't know, half of everything in Fantasy Flight Games catalog is all about the story. Um, these people like improv, light rules, open to interpretation. You can see why it was so firmly rooted in role-playing games, but more and more often the lines between game genres and styles get blurred. Ars Mysterium is a fantastic clue who done it sort of game. Um, I'm sorry, Mysterium. Uh, but it really encourages or allows people to get into the mindset, to enjoy the story through the pictures. And Dixit is all about interpretation and looking at pictures and going with that um, part of your brain and triggers the imagination. And to them, setting theme and being immersed in a story is key. And then finally, simulationist, they want details, the uh, length to which your game recreates verisimilitude. How real is it for whatever theme you said it was? If you told me that I'm a medieval knight, do I feel like a medieval knight? You can see this particularly with war games or any game that has miniatures where you are measuring things with a ruler, <laughs> right? If you are rolling on a separate sub table for the weather, before you take your turn and you move your stack of counters that has a movement limit of four and you've got eight in the stack, right? So they are trying to recreate something that helps you feel immersed. There are about 10 billion games based on the American Civil War. I have played games that have focused on each one of these and found fascinating. I'm not big on simulationism myself, but I've played some games that clearly are more simulationist than others because I have to worry about how long it takes to send a message to another general. I have to worry about feeding my army. Oh my gosh, this was a horrible time. Versus another one where we were laying down tiles to represent different units. And it was vague. People who've played Ticket to Ride, is that really a simulation of how trains work when they can't even put the cities in the correct places on the map of the United States? No, it's about a narrative and it's about a game for them. Well, the thing is, Every single game has some level of each characteristic. Doesn't matter if it's an abstract game, doesn't matter if it's an enormous in-depth game like Gloomhaven, you can obviously tell there are narrative elements to that too, but every game has these parts to some degree or another. One helpful tool and one of the things that I make my students do at the outset of their game design is to kind of create this pie and break it into three parts for the type of game that you want to design or that you think you are about to design. Then later on in the semester, when other people are playing the game, I have other people fill this out to see how close other people's experiences are to what they set out to originally do. So these two games would feel different. That bottom game might be the Civil War game that has food and weather 
and unit and stacking limits and communication and all of those things. Where the top one is more about uh, maneuvering and using command structure better and spending action points more efficiently. They can both be about the same game and both deliver a similar sort of um, end game result, but still feel very, very different along the way. Because of that, they're also going to result in very different stories. And if we're relating stories to each other, if you and your best friend have both designed a game about the American Civil War, hopefully you can describe yours in a way that is distinct and different enough, and it's going to tell a slightly different story or have it broken down in different ways than other people. So this is not a template, it's simply a tool. It allows you to take a look at a game from the player perspective of what sort of player does this appeal to the most? Or what sort of play does this game best represent or put forward? So I like to use the uh, example of chess. Chess is a simulation of warfare. Is it super accurate with it? No, but it has some level of simulation in it. It has a narrative too, otherwise pieces wouldn't have names. They wouldn't go in unique ways. You wouldn't be going after the king, right? So there's a story that goes along with chess. Maybe it's a small wedge too, so that the vast majority of this pie is focused on game, right? But everything you can break down in some way using this tool. So again, take a look at your game and think about how you would break it down or how you think others would perceive it. And sometimes for playtesting, I'll have a little circle chart and I'll ask them to draw little wedges and tell me how much of it do you think was in each. And I'll look at those and if they're way off with mine, wow, I better revisit some things or maybe go back to my mission statement or some of the other tools that I have to see why there's such a disconnect. Or if it matches up pretty closely, that's euphoric, right? I'm on the right track. I'm doing something and getting closer to delivering the experience that I said I would. Oh, and we can't end without both a problem and the number three. Now, I was hoping that only three mistakes would occur. But again, roll with the punches. Uh, so to summarize this part of it and trying to relay your game to others, remember and respect the fact that your game is one of many things that they could be doing. Keeping that in mind will help you better respect the time that they're committing, help you better appreciate that every level of detail is going to matter. So going through the rulebook again, using grammar check, for goodness sake, turn grammar and spell check on, um, and going the extra mile to make your game distinct helps. It helps reward whoever is interacting with it. It helps reward their time. Make stories. Ask players what they thought about the game. Ask them the following week when they're not going to remember cards that they drew or dice that they rolled. If they can out or, I don't know, double guess or outthink or like Monday morning armchair quarterback try to relive the stories, man, on turn three, instead of attacking Bill, I really, really should have gone for resources and built up my army. That's a cool story. It gives them not only something that they can share with others, they just told you that if they were to play again, they could play differently, that they could apply what they learned, that they're interested enough that they could tell a different story, try to get a different outcome. Try to have a really clear, succinct, well-worded who you are, what you do, and how you win statement. Something that you can tell to a person on the elevator ride up, but when you step out of the elevator, that it's a consistent story that they are passing along to others. Rarely are you the person one-on-one -on -one who's going to be making a sale to somebody. So there are always other steps in the way, always other obstacles, roadblocks, people, biggest obstacle of all. So if you want everyone along the line to understand it, you've got to be clear, accurate, and brief up front to make sure that they understand the story and they're going to pass it along in the same way that you intend. And again, I encourage you to do it both narratively and mechanically. Start out with just a descriptive story of you are a, um, a real estate tycoon who is trying to dominate the market by buying up all of the properties and end up the wealthiest person. If you can bankrupt everybody else, you win. Then you can say that 
you're going to be moving around the Monopoly board with a pair of dice and purchasing things. And then finally, and then you can help relate it and people can put it into better context and kind of play the story out like a movie in their mind as you're telling them about the mechanics. Let me see if this last one transitions. Oh, there we go. Why couldn't that have been one with a mistake? All right. So that was a lot of stuff that I went through, but it covers a lot of the things that I've picked up and found myself applying more and more often as I create prototypes or as I approach different publishers. I might slightly modify sometimes that story based on the publisher. If I'm going to go to Stonemaier Games, I'm going to approach it differently than if I go to Smirk and Dagger or Steve Jackson or things like that. So understanding your audience and making sure you can be accurate, brief, and clear for them and adjusting to that audience can be extremely helpful in helping define a game that not only you're excited about, but other people are excited to engage in. What questions can I answer? Stunned, shocked silence. That is either a good story or a very, very bad story. <laughs> yes? Um, so if I were to run a role-playing game, what would I use, how would I rephrase uh, how do you win the game? Would you just rephrase it to one of my goals? Or? You could either rephrase it to goals, or if your game has a conceit where there is a large setting like an overlord who has taken over, then it could be that all of our works are trying to free the people enslaved by this overlord, or something else that drives toward a larger story purpose, or you can always reinforce the goal of sitting around having fun and telling a kick-ass story. Right? When I explain Edge of the Empire, the first in the Star Wars roleplay line, that's what I try to encourage as the how you win, is by really getting into the spirit of being on the fringes of the Outer Rim and feeling like it's Firefly in space, not just Star Wars. Um, Right, but if you can get them to experience and put that in there, that's a win as well. What was the fourth item under gamist? Sorry, I couldn't write fast enough. <laughs> Let me see if I can actually go back through this. Oh, sure. So now, <laughs> now it doesn't mind working. All right. So, so this GNS theory is both um, what people either perceive or engage with or what a game offers, right? It depends on which, which side you're looking at the tool from. Right? When you show the, the chart, the ball chart, could different people look at it differently because that's what they like in a game? Absolutely. So if everybody came up with something different, you might have a more universal type. Um, if it's really, really hard for people to define, it may be that you're not clear enough with what it is you're trying to deliver. It could also be that particular group of people. It's one of those things that if they're your friends and you know them well enough, that you might have more context for why they split it up the way that they did. But during the play test itself, you might actually see one person is leaning forward and reading all the flavor text on their cards. They're probably going to perceive it as a more narratives game. Somebody's sitting back stroking their beard or stubble, and they're looking at that, and they're trying to predict what other people are going to do on their turns. They're looking at it as a more gamist. One, if somebody else is pointing out all the historical inaccuracies that you have in your game, like in Bonanza as a bean farmer, then, you know, then they're probably really, really focused on the simulation. So you could have an entire table of people sit down and perceive it slightly different. And if they were to do that, I would probably ask some follow-up questions to, to see why they did. Um, or I'd try to think back, did I observe some behavior or see something that kind of explains that to me? Yeah. Is there a formula to come up with the chart? Like is there some type of survey anyone's created that's like a weighted, like four questions for each GNS? And then there, there isn't. Because everyone's going to have a slightly different opinion on what each category is. No matter how well you try to define that category, they're going to come at it a little bit differently. The best tool that I have found as a starting template is a pie chart divided into 33, 33, 33. Right? Give that other 1% to whatever. Um, and just start there, and then they can go, well, that's not quite right. This, this wasn't as equal as others. And once they make that first shift saying that these two things weren't equal, now you've got a dialogue, a discussion, some level of distinction. Yes, in the back. Just um, with the GNS theory, in your experience and also in reading up on it, uh, is there any sort of uh, consistency with what games are more beloved or uh, like... Is an even split kind of the ideal, or are you leaning into the distinction? It is a, a tool for measurement. It is a ruler. It is not construction materials. 
right? So it's one way to look at and evaluate. There is no golden bullet, otherwise everyone would be producing that game. So part of it is gonna depend on, are you looking for something that can go on a mass market shelf where they're worried about retail inches and they need something that's gonna be family friendly? Or are you looking at more of a hardcore tabletop audience that is willing to read a 96 page rule book and commit to eight hours on a Saturday to play? All right, so it's going to vary and it depends on what it is that you're trying to deliver and whether you are trying to make money or whether you are trying to create a thing. Um, and to that end, just briefly, when people ask me, I always get asked, can you help me make my game? And I'm like, sure, but I'm not going to. But I find that people generally want to publish a game for one of three reasons. They want it to become a real thing. They want a real boy. They've got this idea and they want to they go that extra mile and make it real. And there is nothing to stop you from doing that with Kickstarter, with all of these awesome uh, services, with Component Studio. There's, there's no reason why you cannot do that right now. And many of you already have through the gamecrafter.com. And if that's all you ever go with your game, that's fantastic. You've still done more than 95% of the people in this hobby, right? That is awesome. Secondly, a lot of people want to get a game to market. And for them, the market might be on the shelves of Barnes & Noble or Target, or it may simply be to local bookstores or uh, hobby stores. And then the third way is they want to make money. And I tell them, focus on one or two. Um, I'm still trying to figure out number three myself. But because you see such successful Kickstarters, or because you see that Alan Moon has sold millions and millions of copies of Ticket to Ride, or Eric Lang's last Kickstarter did $4 million, yes, there are people who do this professionally as a career. The vast majority of designers that I know have another job or have somebody else in their life with a stable, solid income. Because it takes a lot of work, and that means time that you are not spending earning money to design and make a game. Yeah, it doesn't. No, I'm not. I hope it's three. I really hope it's three. That sounds really neat. I also like taking the Meyer Briggs test. If people haven't taken the Meyer Briggs personality archetype test, I take it every year. And the most fun I had is when my wife and I took it as the other person to see how close we could get. Boy, were we off. <laughs> Right? But there are a lot of interesting tests. That would be especially interesting to me. I've also seen a Myers-Briggs version specifically for gamers to find out what type of gamer you are. There's one called Colors Training that they do now that's, that, that has supplanted Myers-Briggs and most of them are modern HR groups. My wife's a human resources director, so I get, I get to get tested a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Good one for you. Be, it, it, does, it really sort of breaks the people apart and more of like the, get, the go-getters versus mm -hmm. the thinkers versus, you know. And I think that's a really good one that might be, you know, even if you have a little survey yep. in your, that you did after playtesting, you could say choose four questions from each of those colors and put it on the list of how, how they felt about the game or whatever. And it could give you an idea of how your game is skewing maybe a little bit. I haven't tried doing this yet, but. I've, I've also provided a word bank where I'll put like 15 words down there that I've specifically chosen. Um, colorful, um, strategic thought-provoking, and say, okay, circle the four or five words that you felt best reflected your experience. Mm -hmm. And that can also be very revealing, because I know why I put those words in, so I can interpret that coming out and make like a word cloud, even, uh, to be able to look at that. Are you saying that you, when you write your mission statement, do you pick a GNS breakdown as part of your mission statement? Sometimes I will if I feel strongly about it that I need to define it at that point. Sometimes my mission statement is more, I am going to keep making decisions that get me closer to this. Right now, I don't know if that is a more realistic game or if that is going to be a more gamist uh, experience. But right now, I know that I want to move closer to a game about elves and dwarves in fantasy. I'm going to use the fantasy football uh, Blood Bowl. I loved it when he brought that up because I was able to do the card game for it, right? So I might start out with the mission statement first, then as I play more, I'll look at that GNS model and I'll kind of play around with it and then go back to it later and see if it's still on track or when I get some play test feedback on, see if it, uh, the, the feedback that I got matches up to what I thought it would be. But again, I, I can't stress that this isn't something that you like 
put over your game and smoosh down and break it up into pies. It's just a, a kaleidoscope, a filter, or some way to look at your game uh, through a different perspective. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one last question or comment, because our time is about done. Dozens, dozens. Many of them based on arguing that the GNS theory is inaccurate and not a good tool, right? right? I just happen to like this one particularly well. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.